Good afternoon, and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Zoom series. I'm Georgia Kelly, the Director of Praxis. Today, we are very fortunate to welcome Louise Dunlap, who will talk about colonization of the land and the mind and many other things. So her recent book, Inherited Silence, Listening to the Land, Healing the Colonizer Mind, is an insightful look at the historical damages early colonizers caused in America and how their descendants might heal the harm done by them. Um, Louise is a descendant of Nathan Coombs, who was one of the founder of Napa, where a major street is actually named for him. She tells the story of the history of this region, including new information about indigenous care for the land, actions of the colonizers, land grabs or stealing, and the latest incursions, which include water depletion and land destruction being brought about by the clearing of land from yet more vineyards, mega mansions, and parking lots. So it hasn't stopped. And this is why I think it's very interesting to look at how that mindset has still uh, impacted what we have in our region. So the author's ancestors were among the first Europeans to claim ownership of traditional lands of the Wapo native people in uh, the area of Napa. Louise also studied English literature and before re retirement taught writing to undergraduate and graduate students in urban and environmental planning. Um, she, it's interesting because in 2004, she was also ordained by Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh into the order of interbeing. So she's have a wealth of information and reading her book has put me on a journey to understand the depths of the colonizer mind and how deeply it's impacted where we live and how we might begin to heal this um, scourge. So welcome Louise, it's great to have you with us this afternoon. Oh, thank you, Georgia. I, I'm really honored to be in this uh, interviewed on this webinar. Well, I thank you. You, I'm so all the other people that you I've not had not known about you until I was invited, <laughs> and yet um, the the people that you interview are all the ones I look to for information, and I was very excited to be to join them. Well, thank you for I that. Did, I will say that I did live in uh, on the East Coast uh, for uh, up until 2009. So I haven't. I did my activism in a different location, and that's right. probably why I missed you. Thank that's you. that may have been some of it. Uh, and before I actually ask the first question, I wanted to comment on the extraordinary and unique perspective you bring to colonization. Uh, and genocide and love for the land as well and the indigenous, indigenous peoples of this region. Um, and you are fortunate to have letters from ancestors dating back more than a hundred years, which gives you an incredible insight into the times and the thinking of those times and how it is still infecting, how it's still infecting our times today. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is, what interests you in delving into the past actions of your ancestors in Napa County? What was the impetus for this? And what were you looking for? Mm. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I was, I, um, of course, knew in my head that there had been a violent takeover of the land from the people, the indigenous people. I'd been quite interested, as you would learn in the book, I'd been quite interested in um, our indigenous history, our history of colonization um, for many, many years and had built many relationships with indigenous people, but I hadn't, didn't know the story in Napa. And I was quite sure that my ancestors were, did not play a good role. And, uh, Actually, it was a little bit better than I had feared, but not much. Mm -hmm. And what I learned from writing the book was it, it wasn't just genocide. It was the beginnings of ecocide. It was the beginnings. Uh, colonization brought the mindset of extraction. And, you know, the first thing they did in, in Napa, uh, oh, in the first... Um, legislation that was passed in California, California became a state was to prohibit uh, burning 
cultural burning, which the Indians were doing to preserve the land, to take care of it. And uh, that, and of course they moved water around, they um, dug up minerals. Um, they just did all those things that have led us to the dilemma that we're in right now. So I think one of my, one of my motivations was concern about climate change mm -hmm. and concern about the, what I learned was the result of colonization. Yeah, I, wanted, I, wanted, to get I wanted to clear, I wanted to clear the air about my ancestors. I was hoping a couple of my cousins who live in Sonoma County were going to be on this um, on this call, but I guess they couldn't make it. Well, if they're not, they can hear it later. Um, I think, it, yeah, I guess we will have the video of it. In your book, you said that the treatment of the native population, the Wapo and the Potwin uh, native tribes meets the UN definition of genocide. Um, from the 1948 uh, declaration. So I'd like you to just tell um, all of us, what is some of the criteria of genocide that you saw practiced with the native, against the native people in the Napa Sonoma regions? Mm -hmm. Well, first I'm gonna say that um, since I, uh, since the book went to press, there's been a lot of new information coming forth and a lot of people uh, starting to look at these things. And I've gotten closer to those, the people, the displaced people myself. Uh, and uh, they would prefer to be called, not the Wapo, but the, On uh, the Mishual Onastatis people. Um, and they are the ones who, uh, the, the term Wapo was the Anglo, I think probably a lot of you know this. I think everybody knows this. It was the Anglo, uh, Anglicization of what the Spanish called them, which was guapo, G-U-A-P-O, um, which means all kinds of things, beautiful, brave, fierce, um, but they were fierce fighters. And that's how they got the name Wapo on our maps, but that's not what they call themselves. That's it. Okay. So, but the question was about genocide. Well, um, I, I read, um, um, oh gosh, it's on my shelf over there and I cannot remember. Uh, 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 <laughs> Is it the UN Declaration? No, a, bo a book about genocide by, um, gosh, I want to run over and pick it up, but um, someone who served uh, as, um, uh, I knew this would happen. I don't have a great memory for names, but I had read about genocide and, and read about the UN, uh, the UN Declaration some years ago. And as I, and I had thought, well, indigenous people are speaking of this as a genocide, not just in the Napa Valley, but everywhere <laughs> throughout the country. And was it? And of course it was, and that, also became very clear to me as I did the research and wrote this. And the, the main things were, um, you know, our first governor of California spoke with the words exterminate. He said, we will have to exterminate them. That was, that was popular knowledge. There's no secret about that. And some of the, um, one of the, one of the, uh, UN features that struck me the most was the, and this is true all over the country also, was the separation of um, of children from their from their cultures from their parents, and this was particularly egregious in our region because there was so much uh, uh, so much of this particularly in the period um, after, after statehood, when uh, Californians were trying to uh, live up to the governor's mandate to exterminate, and they would all often go into villages, kill the adults, uh, grab the children, and take them to be and sell them as indentured 
servants. Mm. Yes. One of one source that I read said that most settlement farms in our region of Northern California had three to four of these children enslaved in their homes. Mm. So that that's um, a, a a very definite feature of genocide. Yes, and of course, it's something we never learned in our grade school and high school history books about this kind of genocide and the separation of children from their parents of the indigenous peoples. We started to hear something about the missions where uh, that were really horrible and the way people were people uh, were treated at the missions. Uh, there was this element of slavery that has never been acknowledged as slavery. And I think maybe what your book is doing is helping us realize that this was definitely slavery and it's just never been called that here. You said something in the book that I found really interesting about um, because once you started looking at the history of your ancestors, then you started looking at where they came from. And they, of course, been in this Northern California region for six or seven generations, I think you said, but they originally came from the East Coast and probably England and that area. And there was a certain mindset of white supremacy, of uh, we have, we know more than other groups of people. And what I found interesting, because I got thinking about this when I was reading your book, and I thought, well, not everybody came from England and not everybody came to America with that mindset. So I was thinking, what groups didn't come with that mindset? And how is that different? Because we still see the um, colonizer mindset so present in our um, in our country today and right in our region in Napa and Sonoma counties where we're pretty enlightened, but there still is this exploitation of land, resources and people. Um, but then I was thinking, well, my ancestors didn't come from England and they didn't come from um, an area that was considered white supremacist. It was, well, maybe, I don't know, Ireland and Croatia. So they came with a different religious background and a different mindset. And so I'm curious if you've thought about the um, immigrations of different groups into the US and if they acted differently, um, maybe a lot of them just didn't move west and that may have been part of it. Uh, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that. Oh, you know, I think I need to take a deep breath. All of this is very heavy. Mm -hmm. <sighs> um, I have thought about that. Uh, and there's quite a literature now on how, uh, first I'll say that some time, oh yeah, when I was in graduate school, I worked as a research assistant for Henry Nash Smith. And he, he was a literary scholar who looked at American culture. And one of one thing that I remember checking for him was something he was writing about immigration in the 19th century. And, you know, the Irish, the Italians, the uh, all the peoples from who were kind of recruited, I think, from different parts of Europe to come and settle in this in this continent. Um, they were they were uh, consider they were considered le lesser mm -hmm. lesser citizens by the um, New Englanders, the Anglo New Englanders, and uh, it. I I actually would like to know a lot more about this. Somebody I know um, wrote a book which I I don't think I've read yet about how how we became, how these peoples became white. And it's, there's, there was a, no matter what mindset you came to this con continent with, if you were white, you wanted to be, I, I think there was a, a pressure to become like my ancestors. And that's one of the heavy, one of the things I find is really heavy that we passed our, um, our way of thinking on to others. I, I found in my looking at my um, 
my great great grand my great grandparents and great great grandparents letters to each other that um they they said really nasty things about swedish and irish and spanish people who worked for them they they thought the uh, they, in in napa they thought they needed to have they needed to start a dairy because the italians who were running the dairies there were not clean enough. So these are things that people, white people thought in the 19th century, late 19th century. And I think um, may still have residual uh, power yeah. In, yeah. in our thinking. They do. I mean, even when I was growing up, we we had these, um, there were terms for different nationalities. There were terms for Italians, for Spanish, for, uh, yeah. we still had vestiges of this. You don't hear those terms now, at least not in California. Uh, you might hear them somewhere else, but those terms have disappeared from our language. But they were there when I was a child, and I remember them very specifically. I'm mostly asking, why did they call them this? <laughs> and not, you know, being an innocent child who has no reason why why this would be the case. So I, that's something that has changed in my lifetime, is that there's been a kind of a disappearance of that. And yet what you're talking about, this colonizer mindset still exists. And yet other people now say they're white, you know, who were not considered white before, like Italians. Um, but the colonizer mindset prevails still. I mean, when we see the um, land just being destroyed, trees being cut down, as you talked about, and acres and acres of trees to make ways for vineyards. This is happening today. And there doesn't seem to be enough political clout to stop that kind of uh, erosion, I guess, of, of the land here. So I wanted you to talk a little bit, bit about something that um, I hadn't ever thought of quite the way you brought it out in the book, which is the colonizer mindset. And you talked about how we need to heal from this mindset because no matter where we came from, it permeates our culture. And have you found some ways that we could uh, understand how we're captive of it and what we might do to get past it? Oh, Georgia, you are asking me some hard questions. I know I'm not proper. Um, no, no, this is good. Um, because I, I really think that we have to do this mm -hmm. as a group. Um, and, I, and I have a head start because I wrote the book and said this. Right. I, I'll tell you what I began to find in myself. Because, and, and actually, maybe I'll also say that in September, uh, I'm going to be giving a sermon at the Univer Unitarian Church in Santa Rosa. Um, and they have asked me to follow it up the next week with a workshop on healing the colonizer mind. And what I've thought about that so far is, um, I think we all know what the colonizer mind is in ourselves. I'm not going to give a list of things and say you have this in your mind. <laughs> I think we know, and I think in a, in in group in group process we can figure that out and maybe make some headway <laughs> with healing this. But um, I found in myself when I was writing the book, um, I think I've been a pretty uh, modest person uh, growing up with and with relatives who uh, thought they were the the best mm -hmm. and the, should be emulated and um, let's let's push for manifest destiny I, I think I've gone in a different direction but all the same I have a lot of that ancestor mind in me uh, I've noticed that um, even in writing something, um, I th I think I'm right. And if somebody says, um, 
did you check this? And I go to look it up. I'm shocked if I'm not right, if I wasn't right. <laughs> and um, I think I'm, my mother and father were each that way. So I, I got a lot of training. But I think that's the germ of what it is. Uh, thinking that our culture is right. And we have, I read, read a wonderful book about manifest destiny that lays all that out very clearly. Um, there was a whole period where, and I think it's, it may still be raised in the disputes about what we can teach our children in schools nowadays. Um, uh, it, it, there was a whole period where Anglo-Saxon culture was right, and it was supposed to save the world. That's what we. Uh, what is it about? What is it that yeah. we that individually we carry that we can honestly speak to people about, and where can we see it happening in the uh, horrendous news that comes across our screens every day. It's interesting that I think the Anglo-Saxon culture particularly has that attitude more than many other groups, and I'm not sure why, but um, but it's interesting to understand because no matter where it came from, it's permeated our society pretty thoroughly. Mm -hmm. uh, before we get into some other thing, though, I wanted to ask you because I thought it was interesting that in your book you brought up about the Bear Flag Revolt. And uh, it's very different than the way we have heard about it. I've never really read much about it before your book, but um, but we have this monument in our Sonoma Plaza to the Bear Flag Revolt, this statue. And uh, it, after reading your book, I think maybe we should take it down. <laughs> so I'd like you to tell us maybe a little something that you know about the Bear Flag Revolt, because I don't think any of the rest of us do. Well, um, it happened in June. Uh, it happened about a month from now in June in 1946. Uh, 1846, sorry. <laughs> I was in 1946. Um, I was in grammar school studying it. And I had all the um, all these stories from my father's uncle, who made a practice. He was a he was a member of the native sons of the golden west and he made a practice of going around and telling about his grandfather who had been in the bear flag rebellion and and that's um bear flag revolt i don't remember what he called it and um the, the it was a how many already know what it was <laughs> No, <laughs> no, no. That's why I'm saying we we have it commemorated on our plaza. Um, the um, uh, the people of my my great 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 grandfather's generation, the Anglo's who had just arrived here, decided um, to act and try to take over the um, take over the government of Northern California from the. Mexican American government, uh, and they so they they um, went to Sonoma and um, to the mission there, and um, I I think they had the, a sort, of, and they did take it over, control it for for um, about a month. Um, what uh, I read several books about it, it all sounded very peaceful <laughs> uh, and no blood was shed, I think it was said, but that was not true overall. And what I learned from reading uh, a writer, uh, I decided to read Linda Heidenreich's book, This Land Was Mexican Once. She is an, an, an uh, Latina woman who grew up in Napa and is a historian. And she she just had a wonderful, she dug out all the things that I had not learned. There was a lot of killing 
of uh, Mexican um, or the Ca the California landowners. There was a there were wild troops of Yankees riding through village native villages and attacking and raping people. There there was it was a terrible it was a violent a very violent thing, and. Uh, these are not the stories that we were told. Now, they've been romanticized, um, which war often is. An another thing people didn't know uh, that I read about uh, from uh, an African-American local historian from Vallejo. She wrote a book called John Grider's Century. John Grider was an African-American man who, along with, she thinks, six others, were taken there with their um, Anglo masters. They were still enslaved at this period in California. So, but they were helping to support the Bear Flag Revolt there. So there's a whole lot about it that isn't known. I would say instead of taking down things that you should, the best approach would be to link up with people, some people from the other cultures that were um, that were uh, involved in this, and come up with a, a more something agreeable to all. Yeah, it seems like it's it's a little more complicated than we've ever been uh, told about it. And there was some romanticism even in our own town of Sonoma about this a few years ago. I think most people just kind of ignore it. They see the thing on the plaza. And I think there might be one person on this call who knows a little more about it than I do. I hope so. I hope there's someone here that knows more. And I'm looking around at the faces and looking forward to the Q&A because- well, we're, we're hitting the Q&A at this point. We, oh, good. Yeah, we are. And I, I wanted to ask one person because I think she might know something about it. Stephanie, are, are you up on this at all? You'll have to unmute. Stephanie, you need to unmute. I was just yeah, just doing it. Um, I don't think I'm uh, very knowledgeable about this, um, but thank you for saying so. Um, I, I, what it all brings up for me is what's the difference between the colonial mindset and patriarchy? Mm. Um, to me, they're pretty much the same, and but the patriarchy, of course, includes the domination of women who then could feel free to dominate their, their slaves and workers if they needed to do so. But they were just passing on what was the culture, uh, you know, with regard to them. So I guess that's where I might have something to contribute. But I don't know anything much about the Bear Flag Revolt. I did see their ceremony once. They do it every year, I think, in the plaza. They do. Yeah. Raising the bear flag and... I don't know. I don't remember it now, but anyway, <laughs> very, well, folks, only, very folksy. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone who's, who commemorates it probably knows a lot about it. No. That's been my understanding. Uh, and then we hear that it was a lot of rabble rousers, a lot of drunks or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, but does anyone have, else want to say something or ask a question or have a comment? Or, they well as they're getting ready to do that it always takes a minute or so um we can kind of continue some of our conversation uh just notice somebody to mute somebody um because i think this idea of the colonizer mind and, and how it has still how it is still influencing our culture and our politics and when i see things like acres of trees being ripped out for vineyards and new mansions built in gated communities and malls and parking lots and all these things taking over areas that we really need. We need the trees. Uh, we don't need more vineyards. We absolutely don't need more vineyards. And it's how do we, it's like, how do we stop that process? So that's a, another political part of the question. I see someone has their hand up, which I'm gonna go to Linda. And did you want to uh, unmute? Yeah, so I'm, you're mainly addressing Northern California. I I uh, was raised in Southern California, where I'm still living. Although I did live for, uh, for about eight years in uh, Santa Rosa, I I mean, what what distinguished what was happening at that point that you you wrote about 
in Southern Cal, was it any different? Um, I don't think it was very different, but each region has different things. I think the the um, in, indentured slavery was very strong there. Um, some of the sources I read were from there. You know, um, what I would really be interested, what I really am interested in is getting people to look at this deep history because we're living on land wherever we live in California or on the continent. We're living on land that had so much, so much awful stuff went down mm. and it hit the earth and it hit the people and it affected the settlers too. I mean, what, what I spent a lot of time in the book thinking what, um, feeling shame and intense dis distress about the world that my ancestors created here. And how do I, how do, how, if you're just ignoring that and letting it sit in you, you don't have your full strength and energy to, to act on behalf of the earth and justice. So I, I really think we have to look at this. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I can recommend a book that came out right as I was, um, who is it? Yeah, called We Are the Land. We Are the Land, which is by two Native American historians about California Native history. And it's so different from the two books about genocide in California that I read because it doesn't just say oh we native people especially don't want to just attack your mind with the idea of genocide it's awful to them to talk about it I've heard I, I've I said in my book and I think it's very very important I've heard many um, elders say we don't talk about that outside of ceremony mm. outside of prayer so this is this book uh we are the land is just a different kind of book that will tell you about all the struggles but not this awful thing happened and this awful thing happened it doesn't hammer you with them it's a very interesting book and the other two books are murder state that's one by a, a white historian and uh america uh an American Genocide, I think that's the name of it, by Benjamin Madley. And I think these books should be um, in my book, maybe, <laughs> for, for a break, because my book is also about the oak trees and, and the wildflowers and the creeks. And, um, yeah, you have beautiful descriptions of the land and the flowers and the things that grow on the land. I mean, some that I'd never heard named before. Uh, beautiful descriptions, just uh, beautifully written. Thank you, George. That's that's part we haven't gotten into today because I think, you know, the colonizer mind, I think to our audience and to people who um, are progressive, we, we want to understand this because on some level we're still impacted by it in, individually. And uh, whenever we feel like we're making a judgment from a group of people, it's often coming from that place deep inside that we're not really right. cognizant of. Yeah. And Linda, also, and for everyone uh, in your region, there are a lot of um, native led groups that are working to restore the history. Um, and I, I don't. I don't have my, I could do a little research and send a list to um, to Georgia uh, for another time, but I, I, I keep running across them and thinking, I wish I could cover all of this and really learn about all of it. Um, there's, there's so much going on right now in the native community to get the land back to uh, and just even to be taking care of a small piece of it. Yeah. And I wanted to be sure to mention to you all that because Georgia had not heard of this when we talked ahead of time, but there's a wonderful project. Um, I think it's in Forestville 
called Heron Shadow. Heron, the great blue heron, Heron Shadow. And it's a farm that was bought up um, at a great discount by a group called the Cultural Conservancy. And they turned it back, they are a native led group and they turned it back to indigenous hands. Mm -hmm. And so there's eight acres in Forestville that's being cared for with restoration of native plants. They have, they want to educate people about this. They have uh, community work days. You can go there and they have a beautiful website that they can talk about that they can talk about it. And there are many other projects of this kind going on around the state uh, and the country. And I, I've... Yeah, that's a beautiful one, actually. I didn't know about that. Yeah. I, I, you mentioned in, in the book about um, uh, your ancestors had 80 acres, I believe it is. And um, I'd like you to tell us what has happened to the 80 acres over time and where, where it is now. Yes. Oh, that's also the, no. This is this is difficult for me. I loved that eighty acres, but um, and this is what you see in the photograph behind me. There's a little bit of a hillside there, and some of these magnificent, super large live oak trees. Um, it was a grove of them where my parents had built a small house. And it was only a part of the huge amount that my great great grandfather had acquired and that was still in our family. But um, about a year ago, the, the family had to sell it. Uh, we're getting too old to take care of it. And I worked very hard with the Cultural Conservancy a little bit and a lot of other friends that I made locally who are including um, some members of the on a uh, Mishual Onastatis tribe who are um, culture bearers uh, and not um, not interested in not colonizing. My, my indigenous friends are very worried about the colonizer mind in themselves also. <laughs> uh, sometimes I hear about that. So it's, um, we passed it pretty deep. Yeah. But there were some people, I would have loved to find a way to get this land back into their hands. And I mean, I still wake up thinking about this. Mm -hmm. And instead, what I got was my share of, of the sale price, um, and which I can devote to other projects of this kind, and I'm doing so. But... Um, well, you spared some of the land from ever being able to be developed. Well, yes, we had protected it already with a, a land trust agreement. So it can never be, this 80 acres can never be used to make money. No one can ever cut down an oak tree that's larger than six inches in diameter, unless it is a fire hazard. And um, there's a lot of other restrictions on the land. This is great for the environment. It doesn't do anything for the uh, underlying uh, problem, as I see it, which is the the injustice of the of the coloni of colonization. So it's a it's a step in the right direction. And uh, the Napa County Land Trust. Is, is doing a wonderful thing uh, with the Mishual Onastadis people that every September they're having a, a walk on the land uh, led by three members of the Mishual Onastadis. And they, they teach you about the, the plants that they used for food, for medicine. They um, actually served a, a little meal to us. I went on it last year. And I strongly recommend you follow them and follow the Napa County Land Trust if you're interested in a way to get to know some people who are are doing this work with the land. They now, don't have any land. They can't live in Napa Valley anymore. Are there many descendants um, of the native people living in Napa or Sonoma counties now? 
I think there are a good many in Sonoma County and probably next to none in Napa County. Oh, really? Why? Did, how did that happen? Well, I think the tribe got pushed out of Napa County and there is a, um, a tribal, uh, they have a rancheria in Sonoma County. That's um, probably why we get the gambling casinos and you don't. No, no, the WAPO don't have federal recognition, so they can't have a gambling casino. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Many tribes don't. That's another whole piece of this history that I'm not very capable of explaining. So but, you're saying that some tribes don't have uh, recognition that they are? Um, yes, there were, especially, I, I'll speak especially for California, there were something like, I don't know, 150 or 200 small tribal groups that had their own practices, their own land, their own languages. And um, during the 19th century, when uh, colon Anglo colonization took place, there was a group from the federal government who went around to try to set up um, treaties with these groups. And they set up many treaties, but the treaties were never ratified by the federal government because the state of California law, including my ancestors, I'm sure, lobbied to have them uh, bear, uh, there's some term for it, the documents are buried. They, they were not uh, exhumed until recently. So there, there are tribes that in good faith, arranged to have land given to them and have a name and a, uh, a, a place in our government, and they were denied that. You know, another thing I found interesting. Another period when many tribes were dispossessed of their um, of their uh, recognition, tribal recognition, because some anthropologists had said they didn't still have connection with their past. And so there are many, many tribes that do not have federal recognition in California. And it's a great hardship for many of them. I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. um, you also had ancestors who were in the state legislature. And uh, tell us a little bit about that, who, who your ancestors were, who were in the California legislature. Oh. Well, the first one was um, Nathan, the first, I call him the first Nathan Coombs. He was the one that founded Napa, and he was elected twice to the legislature. I didn't go, I, I could have taken a year out of my life to try to find records of what he voted for and everything, and I didn't do that. And I, I think someone should do it, because I think every, all these policies that were set up were set up while he was there. So I'm sure he had something to say about them. So what years are we looking at that he was in the legislature? Um, 1855 and 1860, something like that. My, um, his son, one of his sons, the one I'm descended from, was also a politician. And so was my his son, whom I call Unk in the book, also, also named Nathan Coombs. When I was a child, he was in the state legislature. He was a senator. Um, and what was his full name? Nathan Foster Coombs. Oh, he was the other Coombs. But the other one was Frank Coombs in the middle. Nathan, oh, okay. Nathan's son, Nathan Foster's father. And he was... Um, he not only served in the state legislature a number of times, but he served uh, in the U.S. Congress for one term and also was appointed to Japan as the, uh, um, they called it, minister to Japan. It was the same as an amb ambassador. So he had some time in Japan, not a full term. They, they were very political. And then Oh, yes. And then the whole, they, these were all Republicans, um, meaning they were against slavery, supposedly, but 
not the kind that was in California. Um, and uh, there's my my uncle, my my uncle, my father's generation, my young his youngest brother, Uncle John, John Dunlap, John Foster Dunlap, was a state legis state assemblyman and um, senator for a, a number of years, and you may have known him if you were living around here then. He's very beloved to progressives because he was he changed the family direction and became a progressive. Oh, right. Yeah, so they were all all Republicans and kind of stayed with the tribe until this particular... Until Uncle John came along. Yeah. And then it was time the Republican Party changed, that's for sure. Well... Not the party of Lincoln anymore. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'd love to hear some more questions. Yeah, me too. I'm looking around. I don't see hands up, though. I did see Stephanie at one point raising a hand. Did you raise your hand, Stephanie? You have more things to say. I I actually wondered what um, Louise's answer would be to the question of um, patriarchy and mm -hmm. Um, colonization, the colonization, colonizing mind, how she would relate those, if at all. Oh, I, I would say they are one and the same. Uh -huh. I, I don't think we can take patriarchy out of the colonizer mind and or or racism or white supremacy. Mm -hmm. It's all it's all part of the same thing. I, I I'm kind of enjoying having a different label for it than other than white supremacy or patriarchy, because people are not tired of hearing about it yet oh <laughs> and uh it's and i think maybe we can go at it with new eyes a little bit yeah uh mike you have some to answer your question oh oh pa right. patriarchal yeah. well <laughs> let me see it brings up so many things and I, of course i want to say first Louise, how beautiful you just explain everything and just the way you speak so compassionately and explain this, but like what 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 Stephanie is saying, so so the 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 patriarchal mind and colonizer mind. And so I'm just writing things down and I'm writing, how different is it? Okay, what's what they did in Spain, what the Spanish did, the Portuguese, the English, the Australians, what they did in Canada to the indigenous, what we did in the United States to the indigenous. I mean. It is so incredibly pervasive. It boils my blood just to talk about it and think about it. And it's been going on forever. So are we looking for solutions? And when you say white supremacy, well, the Portuguese, uh, the, the, the Spanish, are, are they a white? I mean, I don't think it's a white thing, whatever this is, this colonizer mind. Oh, that's my personal opinion. Okay. And how many years it's been going on, I don't know. And I mean, the stuff you read about Canada, we always say, well, the Canadians are so nice. And, uh, you know, I'm not so sure if you've been reading in the last few years what went on up there, obviously. And so I guess just, again, you know, we go back to looking for, for solutions. Some of this to me is just so incredibly pervasive and overwhelming and has gone on God knows how many years that how, how do you heal this? Uh, you're talking about a, a small area in California, uh, but there's, it's, you know, it's just, I, I don't know. You got to begin somewhere, of course. And then you got to talk about reparations. They're working on that right now. There's a new group just came out with a whole bunch of new reparations for, for I'm assuming for black people in, um, in California and how they're going to pay him back for the three or 400 years of what they've done to them. So, how, you know, and people are fighting it, fighting it, fighting it. Like you say, nobody wants to give in, but you know, no homes, no jobs, no education. You can't go to the bathroom and we're white, you know, the whole bit. So I, anyway, that just kind of, um, I, I, I don't know where, where it starts and how many hundreds of years or how many decades that it'd take to start turning it around. Thanks for listening to me. Yeah, it's interesting. It does go, I mean, we the Romans did it. The, so it's it's ancient on one level, but in, in modern times, it seems mostly Europeans, doesn't it? Western Europeans that had this colonizer mindset. Well, some people are telling me um, who say live in colon who are from colonized countries, like in South America, 
I, I've been in, in dialogue with someone who, who feels that um, well, let me see, let me back up. There's this is this is very big. Where does it start? How do how do we heal it? Healing the colonizer mind is a pretty big thing to give put in your title. <laughs> um, I was starting with myself. Um, and um, let, me, let me, I had ideas as you were all talking here. Uh, there's a whole package of things that I think of as the colonizer mind. And one of them is human supremacy. What's that? Human supremacy. Oh. We take over, we, we, uh, we as we, I don't mean we in the screen, but European descended people came here with the idea that we were, were in charge of the earth, that we could make it more fruitful, that we could, um, and, and it was all wrong. When I, you know, I did a lot of looking because I lived in New England for a long, so-called New England for a long time. I did a lot of looking into my ancestors who settled there uh, from the Mayflower and from other early settlements in, uh, in Puritan and Pilgrim communities. And that those people um, immediately, there's a, there's a great native author who wrote um, a book, Our our beloved kin, our beloved kin. I might be confusing that with another, but her name is um, Lisa Brooks, and she wrote a, a book about what the settlement techniques were, and they were taking over land, removing um, the the agriculture that the indigenous people had there, which was corn, beans, and squash, and they grew them sort of in. Uh, adjacent to marshland where it would get water and then another year they would move it to another another piece of land and they kind of kept the whole thing going they were they were using the ecosystem that that was there and the settlers my ancestors came in built fences diked the creeks drained the marshes, uh, let their pigs and cattle run into the beautiful corn and bean fields. And, um, and the, those fields were taken care of by women. And my ancestors thought it's, it's, um, it's not right for women to be doing that work. Men should be doing that work. Men should be in charge of these communities. Let's disempower those women. And they managed to do that in one case. This, these stories are amazing. So it's all tied together. The patriarchy, the uh, false sense of domination over the land. They didn't know what was going to make that land work. And those people, the Wampanoag people, had been tending that land for centuries and millennia and they knew how to make it work to grow food we didn't know we would have starved if they hadn't fed us so um yeah we need a new story about thanksgiving don't we yeah we need that too <laughs> <laughs> right we're coming to the end of our hour and i just wondered if anyone had anything else they want to say before we um stop the recording Anything else? I just wanted to appreciate you, Louise. I'm a friend of Louise and um, wanted to appreciate Peace Praxis for uh, also offering this space for uh, deepening, deepening learning. I'm, I've come in a sense from a field of education and I know Louise, you have too. So perhaps another hour, another, yeah. another time of this. One inquiry I have, given all the pushback around critical race theory, so so called in the elementary and high schools and whatever's happening in the colleges, from all the learning that you have done, 
what would you say would be helpful ways to keep on offering this, um, the, the information, the untold stories in the way that you have now, but also with elementary school and, and high school students in such a way that uh, like the strong emotions that Mike was expressing and the guilt that the parents of um, people who don't want any of this story told in the schools because they're afraid their their white children will feel guilty and um, sh be ashamed. And uh, so I, I would be interested in how you, we would think about taking this information further um, in a way that could be beneficial um, and not, mm, uh, not suppressed, not, not even more suppressed for the young people and their parents. I'll stop there. Beautiful you. question, Lynn. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have to say that shame is really a devastating thing. And I can understand those parents in a way because I had to go through a lot of shame writing this book. And I don't want to pass it along. And I feel like a big part of my work now has to be, we, it has to be to be talking with people about how we do, how we deal with that shame. Um, both Lynn and I practice uh, um, with the Thich Nhat Hanh practice of Buddhism. So we have a lot of help from that. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, by the way, recently taught uh, in the couple of years before he died, he said something wonderful about why, why someone asked him why people won't look at climate change and do something about it. And he said, because there's too much suffering there for them. There's too much suffering. And I think some of it is shame. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same thing is true for this subject. And I don't know what that means in terms of how we give, um, uh, how we make the materials available in story form to children and to learners. Um, well, that's a new project for you, uh, Louise, as uh, books for children and, and adolescents with the stories. Uh, the, um, what is it called? The, um, there's a Howard Zinn Book Festival. Oh, really? Coming up. People's History of the United States. And uh, they are looking for presenters. Um, and I have, because there's, there's quite a few other settler descended people besides myself who have been writing books mm -hmm. about their ancestry. Um, I got two of them together and we're gonna do a presentation. Uh, we're gonna propose a presentation for that, uh, for that well, group. That'll be San Francisco in person. When and uh, where is it? I don't remember exactly. I think it's in July. And please send me the information, would you? Yeah. But I, I, th I think they'll, I, I have another friend who also has been writing about her ancestors and colonization. And, and sh her name is Christine Sleater. And she just put out a, a book. She and another person together just put out a book about what we can do about the, the, what's going on in the schools. I don't know that it will answer Lynn's question, but. <laughs> no, it's almost like the um, books have to be outside the school system because trying to get things like this in school systems, very difficult from what I gathered, mm -hmm. uh, unless it's in a prescribed history book or a uh, California history book. But stories are a really good way to get ideas across. Um, I'm going to actually stop the recording soon, but first I want to really thank you, Louise, for being with us today, for writing this extraordinary book and sharing your history and your family's history with us, which is opening our minds to what we've inherited, all of us, by living here 
and really start to think about it and how we can heal this um, reflex that we have to be still part of the colonizer mindset and how we get out of it. So I wanna thank you again for being with us and we will have the recording to everybody on this call this evening. I would love to hear who I'm talking to. I should have asked at the beginning for everybody to say a word of who you are, because we're not a large group. No, okay, so yeah. let's, let's do that. Stephanie, say something about yourself. Um, I'm going to have to leave. I have another um, uh, appointment, but and you say something um, about yourself first. <laughs> uh, uh, well, my name is Lynn. I'm a friend of Louise. Uh, together, we have a a small group which looks into matters like this, which we call deepening white awareness or awareness of whiteness. And uh, it's probably enough for right now. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Muted. I think Still. you're muted, Stephanie. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyway, I I, I live uh, I, here in Sonoma. I I do some writing, and um, the whole question of war and violence and why it goes on, how long it will go on, and how to stop it, pretty much been the major question in my life. Um, and uh, yeah, so of course, I'm very interested in the colonizing mind and in patriarchy, because to me, patriarchy includes all of those categories. Um, and I think people have forgotten about the word so we can revive it now because it's no longer corny. It Nobody ever says patriarchy. But anyway. <laughs> oh, some people do. Well, I mean, very rarely, just people like me, you know, who had their feminism training historical feminism. I mean, you know, there is the view that that um, uh, all of this did not, it, all of this came into existence, but before that there was a goddess culture that was ruled by women or ruled is not even the right word and was very different and much more clo closer to the indigenous um, culture. So it's, it, it, it is an expla explanation which many historians have embraced and explained. I don't know how many, many, but feminist historians. And it makes sense to me, you know, the work of Marie and Buddhists and so on. But then tra cha changing it, um, it, it doesn't really solve that problem. It, it kind of imagines it. But anyway, I'm very interested in all these things and I wish we could just solve it all. And, and I feel like people like you who are taking so much of the burden on you, you, you know, you never did anything much really <laughs> yourself. I mean, compared to what some of these guys and other people have done, I, I think we should remember that that we shouldn't get too personal about being responsible for the mess because we're just not so much responsible in a relative world, are we? I understand that we carry that within ourselves, but- um, We're just supposed to be talking about who we are at this point, Stephanie. Okay, uh, I'm done. Okay, go on to Mike. Mike who, who am I? You? Who am I? That's the question of the, of the decade. Who am I really? Yeah, it's a hard question. <laughs> I'm, just a, I'm just a guy. <laughs> born and raised in New Hampshire so I know New England really well and my father ran a boys camp for 25 years so I know kids and I know counselors and I know good people that try to do good things and and help kids and I'm really pissed that they don't allow these books in schools that teach who we are you don't have to be ashamed of it you just have to learn what the hell went on in history it's very simple just learn what happened and we try to change it and it uh, I mean you know I, I I'm a piano teacher I've been teaching piano for years it's a little little bitty thing that I can do to kind of connect with people and, and help people kind of enjoy life maybe a little bit more. And um, what else can I say? I'm, I'm married to a beautiful woman from the Czech Republic who who knows all too well the colonizing mind of the of the lovely Ruskis. I know we all have different feelings about Ruskis here, but uh, she has feelings that go back to childhood that are pretty rough, pretty rough, and between Russians and Germans. 
And yeah, sometimes I feel guilty about being a guy. There's one other guy here. There's been very few guys uh, I notice sometimes on these, and I notice an absence of them today for some strange reason. But uh, I was determined to go when I read about, uh, you know, what Georgia put out there. And so anyway, um, that's a little bit about who I am. And, uh, you know, I had a friend that once told me uh, many years ago, he died many years ago. He's a good guy. And he said, Mike, I said, I said, what do I do? What do I do? He said, Mike just do the next right thing. That's what he said. Do the next right thing. That stuck with me for about 40 years. But anyway, that's enough of me. Well, and that, you know what you just said, Mike, about uh, well, there not being many men on this call. Yeah. Usually we have more men than women on almost every session we have. This has been an exceptional. Usually there are oh, more. Is that true? Really? Yeah. Yes, oh, okay. that's true. Yeah. There, look and, at the uh, next time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Catherine. You're next. Hi. Well, I found you by accident this morning. Um, I have a, a list of from um, friendly favors mm. you were advertised on, and it just caught my eye for a lot of a lot of different reasons. Uh, one that I know nothing about the history of this land. I, my husband and I lived. Um, in Humboldt County for 35 years and moved here 10 years ago. And I really haven't, I have no history of the land and I'm interested in it. And I have a good friend who is a quite an activist in Napa who's working on uh, environmental protection. And so I was really referring this to her and I thought, well, and then I also have a granddaughter who moved recently to Melbourne, Australia to um, Monash University to study indigenous people and in another area that I really haven't delved into. So I was attracted to this and it was marvelous hearing it all. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things popped up for me in many different ways. I have a history, I was a healthcare administrator and then I was a consultant. And as you were talking about things, like things kept popping up in my mind um, you wanted to have somebody look at your great grandfather's voting history and, oh, please contact Sonoma State and have a student do that for you. It's a wonderful project. Great idea. Secondly, you talked about shame. And I don't know if you're all familiar with Brene Brown, one of her major, she's um, a person who has written many books, but Atlas of the Heart was the last one. And she's written about shame as one of her focal points. And I really think you need to connect with her because she has quite a platform publicly, nationally. And I think she would just listen to you with great interest mm -hmm. and be able to talk about that personal shame, which I, which I mean, you brought tears to my eyes because I can hear what you're feeling about the shame. And I think it's very real. And even though we, we can say we're not responsible, but, but I think the beauty of what you're saying is that we are each responsible for something that we're carrying. And it starts with us. It starts with us. Mm -hmm. um, I also have um, an interracial family, my daughter and her husband and my grandchildren. And so I'm very interested in, in um, just the colonization area. Um, we recently saw, and I'll stop, I could go on for an hour. You've stimulated me to no end. <laughs> I recently saw a movie, um, a big movie that was out, one of the uh, Marvel movies with my family. And I didn't get it. There was such violence. It was just crazy. And the kids, you know, I said, talk to me about this. But my son-in-law, who is a, a African-American, said, it's all about colonization. <laughs> and I, I just didn't get it. But I think some of the things that are out there now for the kids that are very modern are very close to what you're talking about. And they're, they're presenting it. And I, I didn't get it. So that shows where I am. But um, you gave me something and I, I will get your book. Thank you. 
think you will be very happy to read it. It's beautifully written as well. Uh, Linda and Rocky, why don't you just say a little bit about yourselves? And then we're going to finish. Louise, thank you so much. This was such a deep and penetrating conversation. It uh, certainly is out, outside of the, the realm, and you've introduced a whole new dimension in, into uh, our discussion and our discussions here at Praxis. Uh, thank you so much. And if you'd like to know a bit more about me, uh, you, you could read my favorite book, Ishii. Oh, uh -huh. And uh, I loved uh, everything you said, though. I'm sorry. I'm also a little tired, so my eyes drop. But I, um, I think you're right on where we are uh, right now in terms of, um, you know, where we're trying to heal past wounds before we can move forward. So this colonization um, process and healing from it is going to take a while. But thank you so much for your work. I really really deeply felt. Yes, I'm going to thank you too. And even though we don't have to leave at this moment, I am going to stop the recording right now. <laughs>